our uh, new member class. Today we'll be covering uh, sanctification and the Ten Commandments, living like Christ. And our theme verse is Matthew 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Okay, so today as we talk about um, what it means to uh, live as Jesus' disciples, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would uh, bless us as we follow Jesus, recognizing that uh, we're not following him for our salvation, but we're following him because of our salvation, because we belong to you, because we've been forgiven, because you've covered us with your grace. We know that we um, have in us, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, the desire to live for Jesus and to uh, live holy lives. Bless us, Lord, in this uh, pursuit of sanctification according to your good and gracious will. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, in this section here, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments and uh, not just, you know, what do they tell us to do, but instead to, to understand that the Ten Commandments uh, actually uh, give us um, a measuring stick by which we can see how can we fulfill God's will. And that's actually called, um, there's a three uses of the law that we can uh, talk about, and, uh, and we'll talk about what, what each of those is. Uh, but the first part here, um, where, and under the lesson, part A, it says, uh, God gave his law to the people of Israel in three ways. So what are the three types of laws that the Bible tells us? Uh, the first one there, um, under the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20, what type of laws do you think those are? Thou shalt not. That's right. Thou shalt not. And then oh, it talks about not um, not stealing, not killing, not committing adultery, not coveting. And then those all fall under the category of moral law. Oh. Okay. Right. So that, that's the thing we're looking for. So the moral law is God's uh, desire for us to keep that. Okay. Then the next blank there says laws for ancient Israel, like Deuteronomy 24. And in Deuteronomy 24, it, it kind of lists t some of the things that the Israelites were supposed to do. They were supposed to, you know, um, care for the poor, right? They were supposed to allow uh, the poor people to come into their fields, and after they harvested, that they had to leave. If anything fell, right. yeah, so the poor people could glean the fields. And that was actually a commandment. So what type of a law would that have been? To share, provide for. Mm -hmm. Right, and it was uh, for the state of Israel, for the national um, state, so we call those civil laws. Okay, okay. civil laws. Okay. So that's what we're looking for. The first one is moral law, right. civil law, and then the last one are the rules and the regulations that govern the rituals of the Old Testament's worship and sacrifice. And uh, in the book of Colossians it says that these types of things are, called a, are a shadow of Christ. And so even though we don't do them today, then the reason is because they've already been fulfilled in Jesus. For instance, um, the Old Testament says not to eat uh, any animals that um, have a cloven hoof and don't chew the cud, which right. is the pig. Right. So if the Bible says not to eat pork, do we still have to uh, follow that law? Only if it applies to how we feel, I think. If mm -hmm. well, it's so said to us. It, uh, and so those types of laws are uh, what types of laws? Do you know what they're called? See, these were called these were rituals and ceremonies, so they're called ceremonial laws. Ceremonial, ceremonial laws. Sometimes they're called kosher laws. Okay? Oh, okay. Right. So the Jewish people call them kosher laws, and so these uh, kinds of ceremonial laws, uh, they include hand washings, and they include, um, you know, like during Passover, they told the people to take all the the yeast out of their house, right. anything with yeast in it, so they get rid of all the bread, crackers, anything, got everything that had yeast. They clean their house out. So, in different types of things, like uh, during the season of booths, you had to like celebrate the booths, and there was Purim, which is during the time you know a celebration of what happened during the time of Esther, and then there was the you know the Hanukkah the celebration of the of the lights that were that okay. survived in the uh, temple during the Greek occupation in the second century B.C. So each one of these are these are ceremonial laws, and. Uh, so these three kinds of laws, the moral, civil, and ceremonial, um, are these things that we have to uh, continue to do? And, and I, I guess it depends on you know, how, how you look at it. That 
first of all, do we have to follow all the Ten Commandments in order to get into heaven? No. That's right. We don't. because, And, and it's not because God lowered his standards and said, right. I'm just going to let you in anyways. No, instead, Jesus came and he fulfilled them for us. He actually lived the perfect life we right. couldn't live. So the moral law was fulfilled by Jesus. Well, he also fulfilled the, the civil laws and for the ceremonial laws. Right. And so even though we're not held accountable to those things, the punishment for failing to do them is paid for by Jesus. Right. And then the requirement to fulfill them is something that we don't do because we have to, but now it's something we do because we want to. That's right. And so um, those three kinds of laws, um, in a way, we don't have to do them because Jesus did them, but we do them because we are free from sin and we want to do them. So the Ten Commandments are things that we continue to, to follow. But what about the, the civil and the ceremonial laws? Well, civil laws in the Old Testament are all about the people of Israel caring for the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, and the alien. So as Christians, do we still do... We might not have to do the, the letter of the law, but does the principle of the, the law... The spirit of the law should That's right, the spirit of the law. So the spirit of the law is still, in, is still seen... How do Christians fulfill those civil laws today? What kinds of things do we do for the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, and the and the alien? Be at the food pantry. Uh -huh. Be to drive them to the doctor. Do it. Uh -huh. Pray for them. Bring them to church. Whatever. That's right. Uh, so God's people have always um, uh, reached out to help people in need, and that's actually the, the that is the spirit of the civil law. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then also the civil laws, because it was given to the ancient nation of Israel during a specific time in history, and the nation of Israel, you know, didn't exist for a long time. And, right. and even today, the nation of Israel is not a theocracy, it's a democracy. The, right. St right, the state of Israel is not, they don't, the, the, the state is not completely run by looking at the Bible. The, you know, it has a, they have a, a Congress and stuff like that, so right. it's a democracy. Right. Right. So it's a different type of thing. So they are not uh, living under that civil law. And the Bible doesn't require the state of Israel today to be that. So the real Israel is the church. That's the, the new Israel. Okay, and then, and we, because we're the new Israel, we f carry out the spirit of this law by caring for the poor. And then the ceremonial laws, you know, if the things about the things you're supposed to not eat and not touch and things like that. Um, Jesus talked about how, um, like in Mark's gospel, he said, um, he said that it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you uh, evil or corrupt. It's what comes out of your heart. Right. And then, uh, right, and then in, in, there's a section in that passage, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but it says, and thus Jesus proclaimed that all foods were clean. And, then, and so it's not what you eat that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of your heart that makes right. you unclean. Right. So the ceremonial laws are fulfilled by Jesus because he lived the perfect life and he makes us clean. And so we don't have to follow the ceremonial laws to be clean. It's faith in Jesus that makes us clean. And that's actually what it says in uh, Acts chapter 10. Uh, there's a story about how um, Peter was on the roof, and he had this uh, dream or a vision, that, and a blanket was lowered down from heaven, and Jesus says, get up and kill and eat. And he says, well, oh Lord, I've never eaten any of these foods before, because he saw all kinds of, you know, um, uh, he saw reptiles and maybe lobster, and, you know, he saw... Um, pork, and he saw things that he'd never eaten before because they were unkosher. And, and Jesus says, what I have declared clean is clean. And he saw, and this happened three times, this vision of a, a sheet being lowered down. I don't really remember that, so that's okay. Acts what? Yeah, Acts chapter 10. We can okay, look at it real can... quick. Well, let's look at it real quick, and it's a story of the vision of the um, of these unclean foods. And by, um, by showing him this, Jesus was actually t declaring that what, you know, Peter says, I've never eaten such unclean foods, and Jesus says, what I have declared to be clean is clean. And then the thing that happens right after that is the reason why he saw the vision. Okay, so on 1066, Acts 10. Acts chapter 10. Okay, starting in verse 9 is the, is the vision. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. And it even says Peter's vision. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so about noon, the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and 
earth, of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything unpure or unclean. The word there for unclean is the word for unkosher. Oh, okay. Right? The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. And then, it, you know, so he saw this vision, and Jesus is telling him to that he can have these foods. But it wasn't just about the food, because, see, the, what were the types of people that Jewish people would not talk to? Do you remember what they're called? If you weren't a Jew, a non-Jewish person was called a Gentile. Gentile yeah. Okay. So the Gentiles were unclean. Just like the kosher, the unkosher foods were unclean. So you have unkosher foods, and you have unkosher people. Pe foods you can't eat, and people you can't talk to. And Jesus is saying by this vision, okay, I'm declaring that these foods are clean, because what makes you unclean isn't what you eat, but it's what you, what's in your heart. And the same with who you and it's right. with or talking That's right. To. Talking to somebody doesn't make you unclean, because otherwise, okay. how would you ever share the gospel with people who are non-Jewish? Um, yeah. Unbelievers That's and, right. Yeah. Okay. So, because now he's saying that Gentiles could be believers, right? Be right. He, because before this, they would say that, uh, well, I can't talk to a non-Jewish person because they're unclean. And Jesus was saying, you know, but there are those non-Jewish people who I include, I want to include in my family, right. in my kingdom. Okay, and then it says that in the rest of this passage, in verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, was, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Okay, because these, Cornelius was a, uh, was a Gentile um, centurion. He was a soldier you know, in, the, in the Roman army. And so why would a, a Jewish person talk to us, uh, not only a Gentile, but a Roman soldier? You know? yeah. And so he... Um, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that he had this vision, the Holy Spirit told him, don't hesitate to go with him. And the vision was telling him this is what God was going to do. He was going to make these unclean people clean through faith in Jesus. Okay, okay. So that's what it's talking about. And, uh, and so that has to do with the ceremonial laws, that um, God uh, makes things that were unclean, he makes them clean. And so we're not held to the ceremonial law because th those things have um, been fulfilled by Jesus. But it doesn't, you know, just like we talked about the spirit of the law, the spirit of the ceremonial law is um, found in Jesus Christ. So what we, we what are the things in the Old Testament that people did in order to become part of God's kingdom? They were, uh, they were circumcised, and then they participated in the sacrifices. So if the Bible says those are a shadow of the things that we have in Jesus Christ, then what has superseded the Old Testament um, signs? In the New Testament, what does a person receive in order to become part of God's kingdom? Faith, the Holy and, Spirit. And the, but it's something that we actually, that, uh, it's a ceremony that we do. So remember the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament were just a sign, but now we have we have something different that's baptism. called a sacrament. Right. Okay. That's right. So baptism is what um, supersedes the uh, Old Testament uh, shadows, and now the fulfillment is found in Jesus. So the ceremonial laws are, are found to be fulfilled in Jesus, and we participate in the reality of Jesus and those ceremonial laws by our baptism by taking communion. Okay. Okay. Well, and then uh, when we talk about the moral law and how it's used, um, there's usually three ways that we can use that. Uh, and so that little box, those boxes there. Uh, the first way is um, where it shows us our sin, and uh, the thing that we can use as kind of like a metaphor for this is um, is a mirror, right? So if you look in a mirror, it shows us who it. Sh you can look in a mirror and see who you are, right? And so if the, if the commandments, Ten Commandments, are used like a mirror, they show us our sin, right? When you look at the Ten Commandments, you say, oh, I have done those things, and I'm a sinner. So that's the first use of the law, okay? Another way that the Ten Commandments can be used is like for people who are unbelievers, that, um, you know, uh, governments around the world all use parts of the Ten Commandments, Right, and, and so what, what is the, one of the reasons why an unbeliever might obey the commandment, do not murder? Because it's the law of the land. That's right, and what happens if they break it? They go to jail. That's right. They pay the price. Yeah, they could even be executed for, their, for murdering, right? So governments com, um, do capital punishment, True. and so um, often an unbeliever might follow the commandments 
not because they believe in God, but because of their fear of punishment. Okay, true. Yeah. yeah. And so that type of use of the law is called uh, a curb. If we use the law as a curb, you know, like okay. when it rains, if you don't have curbs on your streets, then the water will go into your house. So if you don't have the law in the land uh, through the empowerment and authority of governments, then um, then sin gets out of control. But if you have the, the law, it is like a curb. It controls sin. It doesn't stop it. It just controls it. Yeah. So people aren't, you know, rampantly going around killing people or stealing. Certainly, if you think about countries that don't have <coughs> the authority of government or law, then those things actually do get out of control. Yeah. So um, the law can be used as a curb to maintain order in a broken world. But then the third use of the law is the law is the use that Christians can use. So we don't follow the Ten Commandments because it saves us, because it can't. And we don't follow it out of fear of God because we're going to get punished. What was the reason, re real reason why we follow the Ten Commandments? Out of obedience because He loved us first, we loved Him back. Very good. And so the love is the, is the purpose for um, Christians to follow the law. And then we can use them as like a measuring stick. So a ruler or a measuring stick right. is, the, is the third use of the law. Okay. So uh, a ruler, so like you might say, um, I love the Lord because he saved me from my sin, so I want to do his will. And then how you how do you know what God's will is? Well, the, the Ten Commandments are the ruler by which you measure what God's will is. So you say, am I following God's will in terms of, you know, the Fifth Commandment? You shall not kill. You shall not murder. And, then, you know, not only are we to not kill other people, but then we're supposed to enhance people's other people's lives, right? So, you know, um, because, you know, Otherwise, we're just following the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is not killing anybody, and the Pharisees were good at that kind of stuff. They said, I've never killed anybody. Right. right? And the Pharisees said, I've never committed adultery. Yeah. I've never stolen. But what does Jesus say what the spirit of the law is? Remember? Uh, have thought that's right. In your heart, you have that's right. So the uh, commandment, uh, the uh, sixth commandment, do not commit adultery. Jesus said, if you have looked at someone lustfully, you've. Com you've right committed adultery in your heart. And then the fifth commandment, do not murder. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, then you have killed, killed him in your heart. So Jesus actually told us that, the, that um, we can break those commandments simply by our thoughts. And, uh, and so for a Christian, God has called us to use the commandments uh, as a measuring stick of saying, this is what it means to be a faithful believer. You know, not to save yourself because we can't save ourselves, right. but to say, because Jesus has saved me, I want to live for him. And so fulfilling the commandments has to do not only with the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. You know, we can certainly not kill anybody and keep that commandment, but we're not actually killing it unless we love people. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. And you can say, well, I've never committed adultery, but you're not actually fulfilling the commandment if you, unless you look at everybody with uh, love and rather than lust. Right, so, right. and so God uh, kn knows what our hearts are, and uh, and we don't use the Ten Commandments in order to say, uh, uh, this is what God tells me to do, and I I can keep them and get in, get myself into heaven. No, we we say this is what God has already done for me. Jesus kept the commandments, and I follow Him out of love for Jesus. Right. Okay, so that's what we mean by saying the third use of the law is only for Christians. It is um, a measuring stick. Okay, well, let's look at that next passage, Romans 8, 1 through 4. Okay, and so uh, this tells us about what Jesus has done for us concerning the law. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Okay, you found it? One, mm -hmm. 1,096. Can you read it? Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus... Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, and so condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live accordingly to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Okay, thank you. So, you can see there that um, 
that we couldn't fulfill the law by ourselves, but Jesus did it for us. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the fill in the blank there, it says, there is now... No condemnation. Very good. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that sh shows that the Ten Commandments are not about condemning us because in Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus means that there is no condemnation. And then the rest of that verse it tells us that because through G Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me... Free. That's right. Free from the law of sin and death. So we're set free from the law of sin and death. Uh, the law brings us death because it tells us if you disobey, you, you, you'll be condemned. But Jesus sets us free from that law of sin and death. He means that we don't, uh, we don't have to worry about um, going to hell. We don't have to worry about, you know, on the cross when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced hell in our place because when God withdrew his spirit from his son, he took his presence away from him. Separation. That's right. He experienced what hell would have been like for us. Right. But we don't have to ever experience that now because of what Jesus did. So... Um, the way that we can use the Ten Commandments as Christians is actually called sanctification. Uh, and that's a, a phrase that means uh, holy living. The word sanctus means holiness. So holy living is what uh, Christians are to pursue. We, uh, we do that out of thankfulness for our salvation, thankfulness for our justification. So I'll, I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, but this is um, what discipleship is. So you know, Christians are called to be disciples. And disciples are people who try to live a holy life. And living a holy life is, is about, it's like thanking God for, for being saved. You say, God, I'm so thankful for the fact that you paid for all my sins. Now I want to follow the commandments. We can't do it perfectly, but we, just the desire to do it is called discipleship. And it has to do with our motivation. So um, in that next little paragraph there, it says, In Christ we are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.16. And do not have to follow the law out of guilt, obligation, or to earn God's love. Instead, we can follow it because of these, these three things here. The first one is from 1 John 4.11. Not that we loved, but that God first loved us. Okay, And we also can follow the Ten Commandments because it's God's will for us. Galatians 5.16. And then also because, what, let's look up this last one here. Mar Matthew 5, verse 6. That's a, that's a good one. from the Beatitudes and Jesus tells us that um, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. That's right. So uh, that um, following the commandments has to do um, for a Christian more to do with hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We want to do them. It's not that we have to do them. Right. We want to do them. So we hunger and thirst for righteousness. So when we are following those commandments, it's not going to make us more righteous. We're already righteous in God's sight. He has already covered us in our baptism. He actually declares us to be His children. Right. And uh, and so this lesson is about sanctification. And the difference between, between sanctification and justification is kind of like night and day. The, the two things um, uh, have to be understood in the right perspective. Otherwise, people get confused. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, some churches, you know, you, you hear churches that preach fire and brimstone from the pulpit, right? right? They use a lot of guilt to make people do stuff. Uh -huh. Well, what they're doing is they're confusing sanctification, which is living a good life because of your love for Jesus, and justification, what does it mean to be a Christian? You're, you can only become a Christian because Jesus has forgiven you, right. right? That's justification. It's just as if I never sinned. It's a declaration that God does. Like if we were standing before Jesus, uh, the throne of God and, he's, and the devil says, you're guilty, and then Jesus says, but I paid for his sins. And then God, the Father says, not guilty. Right. It's a verdict. It's, it's a declaration. That's justification. It's God saying, you are not guilty. But sanctification is, what do you do once you get released? Do you just say, you know, well, good thing I got off. No, instead we say, man, I almost, went to, I almost got uh, condemned. Right. And now that I, got, I have a second chance, I want to live my life for the Lord. I want to give back. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you saw that movie before called Pay It Forward? Have you seen that one? It's a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, and it, that's kind of like uh, what Jesus tells us. He says, you know, I've done this wonderful thing for you, and I don't expect you to pay me back, but what you can do is pay it forward. Do a good thing for others. So when yeah, we, I understand the principle, but yeah. no, I didn't know there was a movie. Yeah, it was a, it was a good movie called Pay It Forward. It's about this little kid, and I think he was dying. And How old is that? It came out like movie? maybe eight, ten years ago. 
Really? Yeah, okay. it's it's still around. I think I have the movie. I can loan it to you if I can find it. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, the other one, while I'm thinking about it, you had mentioned a couple Sundays ago about a movie uh, from the missionaries and the missionary father who was killed and his son went on to preach to those hmm. in Africa and that kind of stuff. I have to look that up. I can't remember who it was. Me either, and I didn't write it down <laughs> fast enough, but I wanted to get my brother a copy yeah. since he is a missionary in Africa. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go look at my notes. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, what we're going to do now is look at the Ten Commandments uh, from the perspective. Uh, when Luther uh, wrote down in, the t in his small catechism, he said these are the things that all, every Christian should teach their their family members. So, you know, he specifically wrote this um catechism for parents to teach their children okay. and and in that he you know he lists the ten commandments but he didn't just say these are things you have to do instead he said in the ten commandments god is giving us the commandment as a way of protecting a gift what what gift do um what are the gifts that god is preserving for us in the commandments for instance the first commandment says you will have no other gods if we disobey the commandment what we're doing is we're forfeiting the gift of his love and that's right, of God. God himself is the gift. He is oh, the gift. Okay, We're in, right. If you don't worship God, if you have another God, then what you're doing is you're losing God as your, as, uh, you're losing his love. You're losing your, his, your relationship with him. And a relationship with an idol is nothing. It's like a piece right. of stone. Yeah. So it's actually you know, trading you know, everything for nothing. Right. Right? It's like it's, the, uh, it's, a, it's a totally uh, bad trade, and yet the devil is tricking people into doing it all the time. You know, oh, don't worship God. Why don't you worship this other thing? You know, why don't you worship pleasure or worship drugs or worship alcohol or worship another person? You know, and by doing so, we uh, give up God Himself. He's the gift. Second commandment: um, You will do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh, the gift is His name, and what is what do we use God's name for? There's appropriate ways and there's inappropriate ways. The inappropriate ways, of course, are cursing. But are there times we... I use we... it for help. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we can use God's name to do what? To bless. That's right. We can call on him in the time of trouble so we can pray to him. Right. When we're in church, what do we, when do we use God's name? For... When we pray. Right, for praying, for praising. Praise, yeah. Praising, like in songs, and worship, and then okay. for giving thanks. So those are the three things that the Bible you know, uses those phrases. Prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. So God's name is a gift to be used for prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Right. In the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, the Sabbath day was the seventh day, which in fact was actually a ceremonial law. Christians are not required to worship on Saturday because that ceremonial law has been fulfilled by Jesus. Right. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, which I quoted earlier. But that's really the um, answer to this, um, this idea about the ceremonial law. You know, because there are some believer, uh, some people who claim that if you do not worship on Saturday, then you cannot be a real Christian. But if that were true, why would it say in Colossians chapter 2 what it says? We'll see, and out here, this used to be total um, seven-day Adventist country. Yeah. And I had quite a few friends. And, and, and Seventh-day Adventists, what do they say about people who worship on Sunday? Do you know? Um, they are not truly saved. That's right. So they're saying that your salvation is dependent on what you do and by keeping a, a, an Old Testament law. The Old Testament law, it, if it were true that we were to worship on Saturdays only, then why would it say in Colossians 2, verse 16? Therefore, do you see it? Uh -huh. Yeah, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, Remember, in the Seventh-day Adventists right. say that you have to be a vegetarian. If you eat meat, you're sinning. Oh, and absolutely no pork, yeah. Yep. Or with regard to religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Notice he's saying, don't let anyone judge you on whether you worship on a Sabbath day or not. That's what he's saying. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. See, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. See, the Sabbath day was about resting but it wasn't just about physically resting, but the, what's greater than physical rest? Emotional 
emotional, mental, spiritual. That's right, spiritual rest. Because a physical rest is something that you only do for a, a part for a while, then you got to go back to work. Spiritual rest is the rest from our from the work of salvation. We don't need to work for our salvation. Sure. We can rest in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the fulfillment of this, and the reason why we can say that is because the Book of Hebrews actually says so. But if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, on page 1163. Yep. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. And, you know, uh, in this chapter it talks about how Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So if Jesus is the one who fulfilled the Sabbath day by making it holy and by resting in, you know, his, he had 100% um, trust in the Lord. And when he died, Jesus, he, was, he, he lived a perfect life. And then the Father it raised him from the dead. And that was proof that everything he did was, was uh, acceptable to the Lord. So when we rest in Jesus and we rest in his perfect life that he did on our, in our behalf, then we are resting in Jesus. So Jesus becomes our Sabbath rest. So it's not resting on Saturday or worshiping on Saturday that God is really wanting us to do. What he wants us to do is put our trust in, in God and his promises. Trusting in God and his promises. And, you know, remember on the Sabbath day, a lot of times the Pharisees would argue with Jesus and they say, you're breaking the Sabbath, right? You're healing somebody on the Sabbath. Or you're doing anything. Yeah. That's right. And Jesus said, well, my father hasn't stopped working. And what he's talking about is on the seventh day, the father only stopped, he rested from the work of creation, but he didn't stop, he didn't stop working because he continued to uphold his creation, right. to keep everything moving and going. He continued, mm -hmm. God didn't stop providing the rain on the Sabbath day, right? No. So G God the father didn't stop resting. And Jesus said the same thing. My father hasn't stopped resting and neither have I because Jesus came to um, seek and save the lost, right? right? God's, the whole reason why God upholds the universe is He wants to save as many people as possible, right? right. If, if the universe stopped, then life would end and nobody else would have a chance to be saved. Exactly. Salvation has to do with accepting the gift of God's um, love. So uh, that was a long answer to number three about the Sabbath day is really about the gift of wor uh, God's word and, his, and worship. And we fulfill that by doing what? Where do we show love and respect for God, for God and worship? Well, coming to his house of worship. That's right. So the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, has to do with worshiping God, not about resting on the seventh day, right? Right. Uh, you know, it's a, it it's there's nothing, nothing wrong with resting on the seventh day, but if you're not going to God's house, then what you've done is you've not shown any respect for God and His Word and for worship. God invites us to His house to worship Him, and the worship is not just because God needs it; it's because we need it. And God is feeding us. He feeds us with His Word. He feeds us with the sacraments. He fills us up with His love. It actually prepares us to serve serve God. It would be like a pep talk, you know. How can you go out and win a, a, a win a a sports, you know, if you're a football player and you never go to the practices, right? Oh, exactly. It doesn't work. I've never heard of anybody who was able to win in sports and did never practice. Christians come and we hear God's Word. We're filled up with it, and it gets us ready to go out into the world to do God's work. If we don't, Which is basically what brought me back to church was trying to feed my faith and starve my doubts. And without coming to church, my doubts and the condemnation got so strong. It was like, okay, made that decision. So now, in order to feed your faith, That's right. you need to come back to God's house. I don't want to. Those people are just so judgmental. No... Stop uh -huh. judging me by people and come back. And so yeah. I have. Now, when you came back, did you find that church was all judgmental as you thought? Is oh, there there were plenty of times when oh, well. the evil one tried to get me. Oh, okay. But did you find to it to back? be did you find it to be that way though, or did you just think it was at first? Well, let's just say, yeah, that small little incident or whatever. And, of course, the condemnation is I'm walking out here. You shouldn't be here. No, these people aren't really accepting. No, they, And you have to really have that conversation yeah. and take that thought captive and say, no, no, I'm coming back. Yeah. Because well, everybody else, I mean, because the church is not a, 
uh, is not a club for for, for the righteous. People. That's it. Exactly. Right. It's a hospital for sinners. And I I love that, and I believe we are that. That's right, and that's what all churches should be. Sometimes some well, churches. Well, they should be. Yes. Yeah. Because God is the one who is uh, healing us here, and we all need it. Right, but it's hard for some people, mm. just like Betty across the street had a couple weeks back, and it was like, what's wrong with these people? And and she was just, ha it kind of was bursting out of her, so to speak. And I said, there's nothing wrong with them. It just, Lutherans are a little bit more reserved than you, honey. And then oh. she went, Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Because she just wanted to kind of jump up and sing. Yeah. Well, well there's nothing wrong with that. You want to. Yeah, we got some people who lift their hands up and praise uh, the oh, Lord. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. And, oh, Marlucia is one of our most bouncy, she and Teresa, yeah. and that kind of stuff, which is fine. But for some reason, she was feeling yeah. stifled, and it was like, okay, but you know what, babe, go for it if you want to. And that's all it took was, and yeah. then she started singing again. Good, good. So. Yeah, and you know, uh, the way that we uh, worship uh, shouldn't be, I mean, it, sometimes it's good for people to be with people who are going to worship in certain ways. Right. Uh, but we shouldn't judge other people because they don't worship the way we want to. Exactly. Right, and, and vice versa. And that's, you know, every, every church has a problem with dealing with the way that they think worship should be. And if you have people who worship a different way, then there's always that, that kind of a, maybe like a conflict a little bit. But uh, out of Christian love, right. we should recognize that um, worshiping God, is, doing it in general, that's the important thing. And how we do it, we shouldn't uh, you know, get on people's case about, well, about that's that. Just, I'm only responsible for me. Mm -hmm. Not anybody else or what anybody else does. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, as we look at the other commandments, then uh, each one of them is really based on the protection of a gift. If we follow the commandment, then we're then we're able to receive the gift that God gives to us. So honoring our parents is about the gift of authority. Not killing or murdering is about preserving the gift of life. Not committing adultery is God's desire to preserve the gift of sexuality and marriage. Because, you know, God knows that um, sex, sexuality is a powerful thing. And it is only, it's kind of like fire. Fire is good when it's in the fireplace, but if it's out of the fireplace, in the middle of your rug, then it can, yes. it's dangerous. And so uh, sexuality outside of the confines of marriage can become a dangerous thing. Consume. That's right. And so uh, God intends for it to be enjoyed in the right context. And when we disobey His will, then we have lost the gift of uh, sexuality and marriage. Um, His commandment not to steal, the seventh commandment, is about preserving the gift of possessions. Right? We want to preserve not only our possessions, but help other people keep what they have. Right. And then um, Eighth Commandment, do not lie about your neighbor, is about preserving the gift of integrity and, and reputation. Uh, and then the last two commandments about coveting, the first one says, do not covet your neighbor's house, and that's to learn to have satisfaction with your possessions. And then the Tenth Commandment talks about, do not covet your neighbor's spouse or servants or animals, or anything that's your neighbor. So that, you know, I guess if we're going to kind of see how different that one is from the first, because some uh, Christian groups will lump the last two together, and then they'll make number, the second commandment, they'll actually make number one into oh, two commandments. Yeah. Okay. So um, the tenth commandment is really about learning to have satisfaction with your relationships. So satisfaction with your possessions and satisfaction with your relationships is the gift right. that God wants you to have. And so not coveting is um, important, because uh, it's, it's the... It's the beginning of sin. It's where sin starts in the mind, right. and then it goes to your actions. right? Uh, in the book of James it says, uh, sin is conceived in your thoughts, and then it gives birth to, to your actions, and then if you live in the sinful actions long enough, then it leads to death. Right. So that's the way um, sin um, works. So um, d it doesn't really make any difference how we uh, number the commandments. The Bible says that there's ten, right. and it doesn't tell us what the numbers are. And actually, in the Hebrew, it doesn't actually even call them commandments. It says the ten words. That's what the Hebrew is. Oh, okay. so, and so God gave Moses ten words. The ten words, the words of life. And so, I mean, obviously, there's more than, okay. they're more than just words. Right. But, the, but the word, their word, the ten words means that they're not just commandments, but they're instructions that tell, tell us how to live a faithful life. So that's why we talk about the third use of the law is a correct use, because for a Christian... We don't just say, um, what do I have to do to save myself? We say, these are God's words or instructions or 
descriptions. That's a better way. Okay. Instead of a prescription, see a prescription is like when a doctor gives you a prescription. Yeah. Follow these this prescription and you'll get healthy. God didn't say follow the commandments and you'll get healthy. He said this is a description. He says I've already saved you and now these are a description of what it looks like when a person has faith in me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. And that's what the difference between justification and sanctification is. In the in the bottom of my sheet, there I have a little. Um, yeah, that's good. I have a, a little diagram. Okay, so um, if you made like a lifeline, and uh, at the beginning of your eternal life begins with your baptism or your faith in Jesus Christ, and so notice that at that point on a lifeline, I made a vertical line going straight up, and that is called justification. Because justification, just as if I never sinned, that actually happens in an instant. When God justifies you, it's not like something that slowly happens. God doesn't accept you a little bit at a time. Oh, yeah, no. He accepts okay. you all at once. Yeah. right? So when you're baptized, God says, I've declared that you're my child. Or if you're an adult and you haven't been baptized yet, you're still justified when you have faith in Jesus. Right. right? When the thief on the cross said to Jesus, remember me in your kingdom, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say you might get into paradise if you work hard enough or maybe after you die you go to purgatory for a hundred million years. No, he said today. So he said that there was, um, it was just as if he had never sinned. His sins were washed away. God accepted him because of his faith in Jesus. So justification is something that happens immediately. And, and notice that the line goes up to the top and there's this dotted line that represents perfection or heaven. So in God's eyes, when we're justified, we're made perfect and holy. And it's just as if we're in heaven. Because in heaven we will be holy, but God looks at us as if we're already in heaven. He looks at us as if we're already perfect. Now, it's obviously that God knows that we're not perfect. But the thing is that he treats us one way, and he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can work on the sin that we still have. So that's what the sanctification is. Notice that the line starts, it starts at your baptism or your faith at the same time, but whereas justification goes all the way to perfection and God treats you that way, Sanctification is something that slowly continues to grow and it won't make it to perfection until we're in heaven. <coughs> but it's something that God intends for us to be growing in. So throughout your life, your sanctification is something that, sh- that God wants to go Should upward. Should be growing, growing not upward. flatline. <laughs> right. Now, if it were to flatline, if, if our sanctification yeah. died, then the only way it could be resurrected is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. So there is, we never lose hope on a person who maybe believed in Jesus, and then they fell away from the faith because God says, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Right. If one of my sheep wanders away, what is, that, what is he going to do? Oh, he comes to get you. <laughs> he's going to look for you, and he's going to yeah. bring the lost home. So sanctification can, can nosedive, but it can start yes. going back up again when we have faith in Jesus. And so whereas justification is o- something only God can do, right. sanctification is something we do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And so the sanctification is holy living, and it's actually a response, a hundred percent response to what Jesus has done for us. <coughs> so, what kinds of things would uh, sanctification include? Holy living. Remember, we, we look well, at self-control. Okay. Um, kindness and patience with others. Uh huh. Uh huh. Very good. Uh, yeah, being a servant to others. That's right. So we, you could look at passages like Galatians 5, verse 22, is the fruit of the Spirit. That's sanctification. Love. If you are, uh, get, if you are producing fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, then you are growing in sanctification. Right. If, like 1 Corinthians verse 13, or chapter 13, it talks about how love is patient, love is kind, does not keep record of wrongs, it does not... Um, you know, it's good. Have to have its own way. <coughs> right, and it goes on. You know, love, um, love never fails. At the end of that section, <coughs> that shows us that uh, sanctification can be seen when we're growing in love and those different aspects of love. Okay, so, uh, and and so when we look at sanctification, we think it, we recognize it's something that um, God intends for us, and then we can use the Ten Commandments as a way of like trying to measure our sanctification. Am I being loving? Am I preserving other people's life? Am I avoiding uh, adultery by preserving my marriage and helping other people preserve their marriages? All those different things are part of the life of sanctification. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we go to church. Um, it's not because, you know, 
Uh, some people say, well, I don't need church to be a good Christian, and that may be true. But technically, church is the place where you practice your faith. And you're fed the word which feeds your faith. That's right. And uh, it's not because we have to go to church to be saved. It's because no. we God uh, intended for us, we, we, when we were baptized, we are baptized into the body of Christ. Right. So it's like we're grafted into the body of Christ. So to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need other Christians, is... Um, is actually a, a way of fooling ourselves. It's like saying, I don't right, need anybody, right. I'm independent. But in fact, we we belong to Jesus. And so does everybody else. So if, if you belong to Jesus and I belong to Jesus, we belong to each other. You know, if one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Okay, yeah. If one part, part of, of the, the body, body rejoices, all parts rejoice. So um, God intends for us to be able to celebrate with other Christians the, their victories and also to mourn with Christians with when they're mourning. And we bring comfort to each other in those things, and we also bring hope and strength. So the life of sanctification is um, is all about um, relying on the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts so that we can uh, follow God's will. We're not going to be able to do it perfectly until we're in heaven, but in the meantime, God does intend for us and hope for us to grow in our faith. Okay, well, any questions about the lesson? No, I think so. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, this is just uh, one way of understanding how uh, the commandments um, are given to us as Christians in order for us to, uh, to try to be more like Christ. Okay. So uh, next week we're going to look at our lesson on, um, on uh, spiritual gifts.